Kairete o apantes. Okay, Amy, cousin Leonid. Yeah, that's a bit of classical Greek with one uh, breathing missing, but otherwise it was fairly good. So welcome back. And today's episode is going to be on definite articles. So let's keep on going. And you've got it. It's going to be from the Gospel of Matthew and from the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. And I believe that particular painting comes from an actual church, a, a Syrian church. You can see that it's in um, in English lettering, so presumably it's somewhere in the West, and we can find out more details if you're interested. So what we are going to be doing today, there are a couple of uh, problems that I had in putting the PowerPoint together, but uh, hopefully those will not be too bad. So let's look at what we're doing. One, we're going to be doing the definite article. And for those people that don't know, the definite article is when we say the. Okay, so we've also got it in French, so it's le or la. We've got it in Italian, and we've got it in German, so it's der, die, and das. Okay, and we have a definite article in Greek. This is not the case in all of the Indo-European um, romance languages, actually romance languages is wrong, Indo-European languages, okay, so uh, Latin, for example, does not have a um, definite article, and Sanskrit doesn't either, and I think from memory, um, ancient Hittite does, does not either, but it's been a while since I've done it. All right, we're also going to be looking at the cases for those people that uh, speech speak English I can barely speak it today but for those people who speak English uh, we don't really have to worry about cases so much because we use word order instead but we still have the leftover in cases in pronouns so we have she and we have her and we have hers so we can be aware even if we don't really know about grammar, that there's something different going on. And we know the rules internalized, but that is because we have different cases, we have different functions for those particular words. And you've also got it for whom, who, sorry, I should have had those in reverse orders, and whose, you've got those three. So I'll be explaining more about that in a moment. And we have the same verb again and again and again. So the passage we're going to look at is fairly straightforward. That's a good place to actually start. And it is at the beginning of the Christian New Testament. So we'll have a look at that in a moment. If we look at things like Paul later on, so not the Gospels, we look at Paul we'll actually find that Paul is pretty, pretty complicated. So one of the accusations that's often made about Koine Greek by modern professors, and this accusation actually comes from the ancient world, is that, oh, Koine Greek is completely easy, and it's so easy, and it was just written for simple people. That was said quite a bit by... Uh, by pagan opponents in the ancient world. But reading Paul is actually pretty, pretty difficult. It's actually challenging in English as well, and I'm sure in quite a few other languages. But let's go on. All right, so we got many Hebrew names, some of which have changing endings in Koine Greek, and sorry, Koine should have a capital, and it doesn't, but most do not. And let's explain that. So we talked about cases... Okay, so such and such as a case. So we have, she runs to the shops. Okay, that's one sentence. So she is the subject of the sentence. Great, we can do that. And we've got, he speaks to her. Okay, so we have another function. And we can tell that through word order and sometimes through use of a, a preposition. Whereas in Greek, we're dependent on endings. So we're going to have a look at what to do if 
by any chance a name. And those are usually non-Greek names. Okay, non-Greek names may not have any endings, or they may have very strange ones, but we'll look at that in a moment. Okay, an example of a really strange one would be the Emperor Augustus in Latin. Okay, it has its own endings. In Greek, it becomes Sebastianos, okay, which has nothing to do with Augustus, whatever. All right, so here we have the passage that we're going to be looking at. And let's have a look. Okay, so I'll read a bit of it. I'm not going to bore you by reading the whole lot, but we'll get a feel of it. And you can either laugh at my pronunciation or or gently agree with it. So we got Biblos Geneseos, Iesu, Christu, Huiu, David, Huiu, Abraham. Okay, so we can start with that. Um, let's go on to the next page and let's have a think about this. But don't be afraid, it's really not that complicated at all. And I've put the instructions in what I think is going to be a fairly um, easy to understand manner. But of course, as it's a video, you can watch it as many times as you like. All right. So, the definite article. So, Koine Greek has them, like English, like French, like German, like Italian, but not like Japanese. Japanese does not have one, Chinese does not have one, etc. So, just because your language does or does not have a definite article, does not make it a deal breaker to understand. But the good news for us is that, well, I presume if you're listening to this in English, we're understanding what's going on. I might see if I can translate it into something else another time. But because we use the all the time in English, okay, well, we got something that's fairly familiar to us in Koine Greek, which we wouldn't have in, for example, Latin. All right. Koine Greek also has what passes for an indefinite article. So the indefinite article is a, an. Okay, so it's not really that complicated. So the, 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 a, an, something of that kind. Koine Greek, and for that matter, classical Greek, don't strictly have an indefinite article, but they have something which is, is very, very similar. And what they use we don't see very much. All right, unlike in English, although it can and does happen in, in German, the definite article can be used with a proper noun. Okay, so uh, that would be the equivalent of, um, I went to the shops and I saw the Mary. Okay, so we'd understand what was going on if someone said that, but we it wouldn't quite sound right. I'm trying to think if my, my German can extend to this. Ich kann den Freddy sehen. Ich kann den Freddy sehen. Okay, so I can see the Freddy. All right. There is a fixed agenda of a definite article according to which noun it governs. As for that example, I just butchered, butchered in the German. So Freddy is accusative, so we don't make him Dare Freddy, we make him Dan Freddy in that uh, in that example. An excuse, excuses to anyone who speaks German very well, uh, much better than me, uh, for me butchering that. All right, definite articles have a definite gender, for example, masculine, feminine, or neuter. So if you're talking about a feminine person, okay, so a lady or a girl, something like that, then we will give her an attribution, the the word, which doesn't change in the English, does change in Greek, or for that matter, as we said many times in German. Okay, um, so an example there would be something like, um, from a Greek textbook I use, a ho dikaiopolis. Okay, so the person's name is dikaiopolis because he's a guy, it's the Dikaiopolis. Okay, the definite article for, for feminine would be he, 
and that would also be the nominative, the subject. Um, if we were talking about, um, let, let's let's use Mary for example, Herr Maria, okay, um, Mary, okay. The difference between that and modern Greek is that the the hair would be pronounced without the um, the H. Okay, so the, without the rough breathing, which would be the technical word, and we'd also pronounce the um, the air as an e, so it would be e Maria. But let's go on from there. All right, definite articles have a particular number that is singular or plural, and as we announced with some joy uh, in our last lesson, we don't have to worry about the dual, so which is only referring to two things. So you can. Go to your classical Greek or to your Sanskrit for your feel of that. All right, so let's look at the definite article. And I'm fairly sure I got all the accents right on here. Uh, and we're not going to worry about the accents so much right now. But let's just say that the accentation can in some ways actually help you. Um, it began to be used as a guide for people who didn't speak Greek on how to speak Greek. And originally it was probably used to speech, speak at a higher or a lower pitch. But later on it just became for uh, purposes of stress. Okay, but it's not really that hard. So we've got those two tables. Uh, both are actually mis um, or not labelled at all. The top one is talking about the singular, and the bottom one is talking about the plural. Okay, so we can do that. So the masculine, we'll explain the, the cases in a moment, is going to be ho, as we said before. The feminine is going to be he. Excuse my very poor eyesight. I can't see whether I put a rough or a smooth breathing on, but it should be a rough breathing. So if it looks like a comma at the begin sorry and a and a post well what am i saying a single quote mark okay that's better at the beginning of a quote then that's how it should look okay um i seem to have the accent wrong on the neuter but uh, bear with me on that that should in fact be an acute and it should just be to Okay, do notice with the neuter that the nominative and the accusative are the same. Okay, they're the same. And that is one way that we can actually spot a neuter. That's great. Okay, so just to explain those very quickly, the nominative is the subject. So it's the person or animal or god or even a place that is doing the action of the verb or being the action of the verb or for that matter becoming the action of the verb the accusative is the object so how can i say this without confusing um it's the person thing or place that is receiving the action of the verb so if we had something like um bill calls jenny then Bill will be the nominative, and Jenny would be the accusative. Okay, so that's okay. And most of the time, the accusative is going to be used just where we would expect it to be used in the English. Occasionally, it does surprise us, but other than that, it's okay. All right, the genitive, that's very simply possession. So if we had something like, um, I saw... Jennifer's dog, okay. then we're going to use a genitive for Jennifer, okay. and we're going to use an accusative for the dog. Okay, and there we would have a place where we could use a definite article. So um, we'll talk about that more later. All right, so we got two ways of using the genitive in English. One is the Saxon genitive, or the equivalent thereof, where we have an apostrophe S, or we have the S with an apostrophe afterwards if it's plural, or if they are plural, and the other one is of the something. So if it's like, I see the dog of Jennifer, okay, then Jennifer is still going to be in the genitive. All right, dative. Now, dative is 
when you're giving something to someone or showing something to someone. Now that too is not the same as I go to the supermarket. We probably use the accusative for that. And the dative we would use for what is called the indirect object. So if, okay, let's have this example. I give the dog to Jennifer. Okay, so I either we've abducted the poor canine or whatever and given it to her. So she is the recipient. She she's she's actually getting it. So I subject give the dog accusative to Jennifer dative. All right, no worries. And there let's just reiterate that if we was going to say to Jennifer, okay, then we would have to use tear and we would have to use um, whatever the Greek for, for Jennifer would be. I'm not entirely sure. Um, do notice under the dative of singular of all of those, the masculine, the feminine, and the neuter, they have a little symbol just under the vowel. So we have the omega. So omicron is the small o. Omega is the long o. It's not really that complicated. It's just pronunciation. So o and o. Oh, or. But you also have an iota subscript under there. So an iota subscript is really not complicated at all. It just means that you write an iota underneath underneath a long letter, either an omega or an eta, either of those two. All right. So I'm sure we'll see that before uh, too long. Um, also, I'll note, uh, and I did note in my last video, that Jesus talks when he gets challenged about whether he's come to change the law, and he says, I am not here to change one iota of the law. Okay? So it's that really, really, really small letter. So his point was he's not here to change it at all. All right. And then we'll go into the plurals, and we'll just do those quickly. So if we need to have the talking about something in the plural, so the farmers, which we're going to see next, then we would start with hoi, because farmers are unfortunately uh, always masculine. So sorry, ladies who are farmers. Okay, if we had hi, then it would describe something that's feminine. And by the way, masculine and feminine do not only describe masculine and feminine people, or for that matter, animals. They can also describe things. Things usually have a gender. So it's not as though every thing is going to be neuter by, by definition. It's, it's not going to be like that. So the word for field is going to be agros, so it's going to be ho agros, and we'll talk about the innings later. And the word for a festival will be he eota. Okay, so no worries. And we'll actually turn over to the next page because I think I'm stealing what I put on the next page anyway. Oh, hang on. No. So that gentleman is a farmer. He's a farmer, and we've got uh, on the next page, we've got the word for the farmer. So, ha autorgos. Okay, so that would translate as something like he who works by himself or something like that. So, we got erga, erga, so jobs work, ergon. Okay, uh, and then we've got autos, which means um, him himself. I believe the modern Greek word for farmer is going to be or agrotis, and um, that's something uh, a little bit different, which I don't think is shown at all in the ancient word. Another word I believe for a farmer is geogos, which uh, comes comes to have the uh, become the name George. Okay, for the feminine, we can see the uh, definite article, and we got he, so the, kore, so the girl, and I believe that that is the term that is given to Mary. Okay, so 
Um, and in fact, when I did a Google search for the word just to make sure that I put the accents correctly, then um, Mary's picture was in fact the first one that, to come up. All right, and finally we've got a neuter word. We've got tordendron. We've got the tree. So it's a very glamorous word. So if we needed to make all of those plural and, and still keep them as nominative, still keep them as a subject, we've got hoi alturgoi, hai korai, and ta dendra. But that's another matter. This video is kind of like becoming much longer than I thought it would be. So there we've got them changing into the various cases. So we've got Ho Alturgos, the farmer. The farmer went to Coles, um, just to show that I'm Australian. And then we've got the next one, Jennifer saw the farmer. Poor Jennifer. She's used in all my examples today. I'm very sorry. I don't actually know someone called Jennifer, I'm just using it anyway. And then we've got the last one, we could have the field of the farmer, so the genitive, we're putting it all together. And we've got the same for the maiden, we've got, uh, uh, sorry, maiden, the girl, it strictly means the girl, so we've got another one, the word patenos, which means the maiden. Uh, so we could have something like the girl sees, and let's choose a different name, sees Dennis. Okay, so we've got hekore, we've got the word for seas, and we've got the, the Greek for Dennis, whatever that might be. And then we've got tenkoren, okay, so we've got Dennis sees the girl, okay, no worries. And then we've got, um, what can we do that's genitive? What did we do before? All right, um, I see the dog of the girl or the girl's dog okay great the next one we've got the tree is big okay we can do that um, i see the tree for the accusative todendron and then lastly um, aren't the leaves of the tree pretty so that's genitive great so let's have a bit of a look so as we said, we're just going to translate. I'm hastening a little bit through this, um, not because I think it's not useful, but because uh, this video is massively becoming a lot longer than I thought it would be. So we're just going to translate that uh, first line. So Biblos, Geneseos, Iesu, Christu, Huiu, David, Huiu, Abraham. Okay. So we've got the sentence, I won't read it out again. Oh, that looks great, doesn't it? Okay, first of all, we've got Biblos, the book. Ah, I hear you say. Why doesn't it have a definite article if it's the book? Okay, well, I think the reason for this, there are occasions where the, I won't say the classical Greeks, but the writers of the, uh, writers in Greek in the New Testament annoyingly leave out the definite article where you, where you would expect it. But I think that the reason is because this is a title. So the title in the ancient world was not in fact Matthew, if you want to, to go and read uh, or listen to. He's got a very good series of podcasts. Um, Dale B. Martin from, from uh, Yale. Then he... he explains exactly um, who wrote the Bible and when. And the answer is that we're not entirely sure who wrote the Gospels. Oh, sorry, it's gone again. All right, so we got the book, Biblos. Okay, if we did have a hot in front of it, that would tell us that it was nominative. Okay, we got Geneseios, of the beginning, of the birth. So if you remember the former table, that should be the genitive, even though we've never seen that that ending before. So rather annoyingly, Greek actually has a number of ways of putting its nouns together. It in fact has three, and the variations of the third of those ways have to be seen to be believed. All right, it's gone again. All right, here we go. So the book of the beginning or of the birth, if you prefer. So we know that word genesis, okay, it's the word of the 
uh, is the name of the, the the first book of Moses, so or the first book in the Christian Bible. So the book of the beginning, Jesu Christu, okay, of Jesus Christ. We can say that that's a genitive. For some reason, I refuse to put that Genesaios is genitive, but it it really actually is. Okay, and I forgot to put that Biblos is the nominative, so uh, be aware of that. Oh, it's gone again. All right, Biblos, Geneseos, we've done that. Jesu Christu, okay, done that. Okay, of Jesus Christ. Hui you, son. We can say that that's genitive as well. So it's going to be what's called the genitive of apposition. Actually, it is, doesn't have to be genitive of apposition. Anything can be an apposition with another word, which means that you have one noun in agreement with another. So it's not necessarily easy to do in English, but we can do it in Greek and we can do it in Latin because they have endings, so we know exactly what, what goes with what. Oh, it's gone again. Okay, Huil David. Okay, now this is the annoying bit. This is the really annoying bit. So David, as we said, there are certain names which are not Greek, which don't behave like Greek words, I they don't have endings, and it's incorrect to say they don't have cases, they have cases, but you have to, you have to make really an educated guess of what those, those are, and I presume, that, as I said, this passage is not hard, but I presume that there would be some confusion in the ancient world as well, so we've got Jesus Christ, the son of David. Okay, so the of David is not going to go with Huiu. So, yes, I know that Jesus Christ wasn't the literal and... Um, yeah, he wasn't the literal son of King David. So he was the son of Joseph. But the point is that Matthew is making is that he was a descendant of David. Now, if you remember back from the, the Old Testament, if you haven't read the Old Testament, it doesn't matter. But uh, back in the Old Testament, uh, David is basically the second king of Israel after Saul. And he is seen to be legitimate because Saul doesn't do everything that he's told to do and goes and consults witches and so forth. But David, however... Um, gets promised that uh, that he and his descendants are going to be kings forever. So the whole point is going to be that Jesus Christ, because he is descended from David, actually has a right to the kingship. But this kingship is not going to be the sense of a king on a throne in Jerusalem who basically rules over his people, but rather um, it's going to be well, something else. I'm sure we'll we'll find out what that is later. All right, it's gone again. All right, Huiu, genitive, the son. So the son of. Now I'm going to suggest it probably goes with David. Okay. And we have the last bit, Abraham. So genitive of Abraham. Okay. So how do we infer? How do we possibly infer that David and Abraham have to be genitive? Okay, well, part of this is a rather annoying answer that's given by all of your language teachers. You have to tell by context. Okay, we have to tell of the context of what's around. So many people will know this passage very, very well in the English. Okay, so that's okay. We can infer that that must be the case. Okay, but if we don't have that, we just have to say why are they there? We don't know why they're there. You have to infer why they're there. So we got Jesus, the son, or probably more literally the descendant of David. Okay. Now, I'm up in the air as to whether the wheel should in fact still refer to Jesus or refer to David. Descendant of David, descendant of Abraham. So, well, I suppose Jesus has to be descended from both of them, even if David is the descendant of Abraham. 
And um, again, if you know the Old Testament, uh, David is not the the son of, of Abraham. All right. That picture I gave there is because in an episode of The Simpsons, Homer thinks that he's going to die and therefore decides to listen to the Bible as a way of, um, I don't know, redeeming himself or something like that. But he actually listens to basically the bit we're talking about, where they talk about son of this, son of that, son of that. may actually not be from Matthew. I can't actually remember. It might be from the Old Testament. But anyway... Let's just say that these passages are not vastly interesting. All right, so a little begetting. Okay, not begetting. So to beget someone means to engender them. So help in giving them life, but not necessarily give birth to them, because that was usually reserved. I say usually, it was always reserved uh, for for the the ladies. So the sections of the Bible that involve, I'll just read this out, involve long genealogies are rather famous, often for the wrong reasons, because those people that pick up their Bibles at random and, and hope for some very edifying passage often get to the bits about someone begets someone who begets someone who begets someone, and they either check the Bible down in disgust or think that's very meaningful. Let's just say that the lists of family history were considered very important. So the point here is Matthew wants to show that Jesus was a descendant of David and therefore has legitimacy, as we said, for his claim of kingship. So he's the king. So here he lies the king of the Jews. He may not have ever had a throne. He definitely didn't have an army. But one of the points that is made is that he has come as um, as the king, and you have that in the, the in Matthew's nativity story as well, where where the actual king Herod uh, is pretty jealous about what happens. And as I said there, Paul later makes claims stating that he comes from the tribe of Benjamin, but he doesn't do it at such great length. I'm sorry for the formatting there. It is missing a full stop. Bad Leonid. The translation of the text, however, is extremely straightforward, with only names, without a definite article, posing any problem. Aha! We've already seen that. Let's see how we go. All right, the reason I put in that lovely, lovely picture, which actually comes from Catalonia, is because because it is from the village of Beget. So a bit of begetting, okay, which has really nothing to do with what we're doing, but a nice picture. All right, so the verb of begetting is egenese, okay, which it comes from gena or in the present. Now, I won't spend a great deal of time talking about it, but aorist means in the past and has been completed. So as opposed to um, the imperfect, which was, was doing or used to do or began to do. And it is third person singular. That's not really that hard. That means there was one of them. And we're talking about the third person. And yes, I am aware that it, it generally generally took in the Bible at least two people to, to make a child, but unfortunately for the ladies, usually it's only the men who are mentioned. So let's go on. So we got Abraham, again ese ton Isaac, Isaac de, again ese ton Jacob, Jacob de, again ese ton Judan, Kaitus Adelpus autu. There. So the first bit. Abraham, his nominative, begat. Okay, so you you'd often see that in the King James version of the Bible. I think I've got that right. Um, and that means, what's a better word? He engendered. I I don't know if that's even a thing. Um, I wouldn't put he gave birth to because that sounds a little odd in in the English because he he didn't give birth to anyone. Um, rather, I suppose it was Sarah who was involved in that, but let's go on from there. So we've got egenese, that's the, the verb, 
we said it comes from genna o, that's the, the present form. So if you were to look it up in um, a Koine Greek or a classical Greek dictionary, you look up genna o, that will give you the future form, that would be geneso, and then you would have the eris form, and you would also have the perfect and the future perfect, I think. All right, let's go on. So we've got ton izak. Great, that looks like a definite article. So this is not too confusing for us. So Abraham begat ton izak, begat Isaac. That's straightforward. It even retains the word order that we might expect in, in English. Isaac de. So Isaac is nominative there, and we're not given a definite article, but we are given the de. We're just going to have that as and. So and Isaac. There are two words for and. There's de and there's also kai. And the de, I suppose, those you would say would be roughly, very roughly related to um, et in Latin. So it does mean at, but it can also mean but in certain circumstances. But we can see from there, it but wouldn't make any sense really. So again, it's a begat. Okay, same thing there. Ton Jacob. Okay, begat Jacob, who has also got... Uh, a definite article. So we can see that he is the object. So Isaac, subject, again, ese, the verb, ton, that makes it the, the object, the accusative, Jakob. All right, so we had the full thing. That wasn't too hard. Um, and Jacob, uh, I don't think I'm going to take you through too much more of this, but let's just check. Uh, Jacob begat. Okay, we've got ton yudan. Okay, so uh, I wonder whether. Uh, okay, so begat. Jacob begat Judah and tus. That looks like a plural because it is Adelphus and the brothers out to of him, referring to Judah. Okay, so beget Judah and his brothers. So if you remember the story in Genesis where the son that is particularly mentioned, even though there are quite a few of them, 12 or 13, I, uh, I can't remember offhand, then uh, Joseph is the one who is usually mentioned, but we've got Judah mentioned there. So let's go on. So Judah and his brothers. All right. So we're getting to the end. You've been very, very patient, and there is going to be a small test at the end. So it's looking fairly male so far. Okay, that was the best picture of all males that I could have that was not under copyright. Uh, if it is under copyright, I'm sorry. Okay, but I'm not like earning any money out of it, so uh, keep on going. All right, so we've got Salmon de Agenese, Tom Boas. So we've got Salmon beget, and don't forget the and, so the de, and Salmon beget Boaz. So, uh, sorry, I think it should be Boaz. Okay, and now we've got a feminine, feminine definite article. So beget Boaz from his wife Rachel. Okay, and Boaz engendered Obed, okay, from Ruth, okay, so no worries, it's fairly straightforward, and the last thing I'll mention, because we'll, uh, I'll let you go now, so we got Obed, so he, he's a guy, engendered Ton Yesai, okay, we can say it's accusative, just that that yes, I is going to be Jesse, so he's the father of David, and we'll find out more about that later. But do have a look at the fact that those endings are not Greek at all. Occasionally, and we didn't see any today, occasionally there are words which can be changed so that they can sound like Greek words, 
but we don't really have it there. All right, and in the next episode, uh, I don't know yet, but it's going to be something exciting. All right, so thank you all, everyone, and I will talk to you again later. Bye-bye.